After the uh, 65 rebellion, a riot, or whatever you want to call it, I call it rebellion, uh, the government came in with all these little pimp poverty programs and, and uh, trying to buy Negroes out, and they, they did a pretty good job, you know, and I can tell you that from looking back at it. They did a good job of uh, these Uncle Tom, handkerchief head, E-like type Negroes, these educated Negroes, these college degree Negroes getting paid to try to pacify the people in the community, the lumpen proletarian and the, and the people on the blocks and the people that uh, had been suffering the most. And, you know, they came out with the team posts and they came out with all these different programs, you know, trying to appease people. And, uh, you know, most people, I believe, saw it for what it really was. And if you know anything about power, you understand the power of, of the status quo. And that is in order for power to continue to stay in power, they have to focus all of their activities on the status quo. As long as they can keep everything going today, then their job is that when the sun come up tomorrow, that they have to have all the mechanisms working that they can, can do the same thing tomorrow and then the next day. And as long as they can stay in control day to day to day on the status quo, then they can stay in power. Then they're in a position where they can long range, long have their long range programs. They can have their think tanks, their RAND Corporation and all of these people. They can project things out for 15, 20, 30 years and so on and so forth. So uh, this is basically what they had these Negroes come in there and do is to pacify us for a while knowing that once we was pacified and we got over that rage that we would basically fall back into the same groove because the rent had to be paid, the kids had to be fed, you had to have clothes, you had to have a job, you had to continue. So, you know, and uh, that's why making revolution has never been profitable, it's never been glamorous, and it hasn't become from the heart uh, what people believe because they make it so unattainable to be a revolutionary or to be against their system. It, it, it almost tries to wipe you out and make you as if you don't exist. So this is what they did after the riot. They came in and tried to placate the community to get people to, you know, uh, think that, you know, even though things were bad, that they could be worse and that they should be grateful. See, the Negro should always be grateful. We should always be happy for what we are and where we are because it could always be worse. At that time, you know, this is a, came at a time where the civil rights struggle was, was, was getting its peak you know, whatever they was going to get from all this nonviolence, they basically had got it or wasn't going to get it. Uh, at the time after the riot, the only really group, militant group, not the only one, but the most popular at that time was Karanga and his thing. And that was only appealing to certain people. It definitely didn't have, I had no appeal for me. Uh, also, the, the socialists, the SNCC, and the, you know, all of these people, they were in the process of going from nonviolence to going to advocating revolution, you know. So uh, it was a vacant area there. And as you know, the party started in uh, 66 up in Oakland, but it didn't get down here to LA until the middle of about 67. And that was just in a small nucleus that really, uh, it really hit the scene really in 68. 